last section of economics we've covered, and then um, next week we start on the safety topic. So just on that economics, the midterm is in a week and a half from now, and that midterm will only be on the economics section. So up to today's class. One other thing, or two other things. Uh, thanks for all the hand-ins for the assignment this week, and. Just a note on your group logbooks, keep your group logbooks up to date. That will be implicitly graded in with the assignment. Okay? So some portion of the assignment in the future now, at the end of the term, will always have a portion due to the group logbook. So you shared that once back a week and a half or two weeks ago. Keep that up to date and we'll uh, keep looking at the tiers and that sort of thing. The second point is on the quest. So those emails went up yesterday. You should have received that. That uh, quest is you do it at your own time when you have, I think it's one hour for this week, you have to answer a few questions and to give some peer feedback. The cutoff date time is Saturday night, I think it's 6 o'clock. So you have any time between now and then to, to find an hour, and you, you'll need much less than an hour. Any questions on that? So a few students last night actually didn't do it, so just make sure you, uh, you, you fill it in. It, it, is, it, is a, uh, it is a footnote grade attached to that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about this last topic here. I have two sections in today's class to finish up with. And both are very important. They're not, the fact that I'm not spending a lot of time on them doesn't mean they're not important. The fact is that they're fairly straightforward to understand conception, so we don't need a whole lot of time. But the economic importance of these next two sections uh, is critical. So the first one that we're looking at is when we're making comparisons. So we're back to this idea of choosing between alternatives. A few weeks ago, we said, what if we can choose, we've got a, a pot of money to invest, so a million dollars, and can I pick projects A, B, C, D, and which of those projects do I pick to best invest that money? And best can be categorized in many ways. So if you look at the NPV was one way, and the ECFRR was another way. And what we looked at then in that specific context was when those projects were independent of each other. There's no relationship between buying those two items. It would be the equivalent of you going to decide Am I going to spend my money on buying a vacuum cleaner or a laptop or both? The vacuum cleaner doesn't impact the laptop, the laptop doesn't impact the vacuum cleaner. If you buy one, it doesn't mean that you preclude yourself from buying the other. We're going to look at today now when we're making decisions where there's mutually where there are mutually exclusive. So here's a here's a chemical engineering example. A chemical engineering example is you have a stream of the pollutants coming in that you need to treat. You can consider three technologies to treat that. You could look at reacting that pollutant away by some mechanism. So a reactor that will convert the pollutant to some other neutralized component. You can look at liquid-liquid extraction to separate out that pollutant. Or you can look at a different separating um, mechanism where you use adsorption. You need to spend money on this. You need to pick one of them. You don't you will never buy two of them. If you, you're buying the technology to treat your stream of pollutants, you're going, to sat, you're going to satisfy that objective by picking one of those projects. So that's a mutually exclusive alternative. It wouldn't make sense to go purchase uh, both these technologies. <coughs> the technical reason for it, right? That the one technology uh, is, is like 80% of the work you needed for the rest of the other technology to do the rest of the time. But that's not our situation. We're considering a case here where you either buy A, B, or C, but you're not going to buy A, A, B, B, C, or A, B, and C. You can pick one. Another case where this shows up a lot is um, on equipment with upgrades. So let's go back to a car example. It's an easy one to understand. You purchase a car, you get the base model. That's option A. Or you purchase the base model, with the upgrades, the nice rims, the seats, the rear view mirror that automatically turns itself off with the reflecting lights, and etc. Et so you're still going to buy the car, but you're going to buy the car with the upgrades. You're not going to buy both. Okay, so that's where we are here. And that so this actually comes up a lot. This 
idea of buying a base unit with upgrades or looking at alternative technologies. Now, when we're looking at this discussion, we're making some assumptions. Yeah. The assumptions are that every candidate we're considering, project A, B, C, and so forth, each one of them satisfies your needs. Okay, so in the car example, you need a car, that's your need. Whether you get it with the upgrades, it, it just takes, takes it to the next level. But the minimum requirements of getting it from A to B with your car are satisfied. We also assume, of course, that our safety and legal restrictions, ethics, and these other important topics are also satisfied by all the, all the potential projects. We also make this assumption here that any benefits and costs can be quantified numerically. Now that's not always true. And we always assume that we can quantify that fairly accurately because we're going to generate cash flows from this. So we're assuming as well that little uncertainty exists. So the next half of today's lecture is addressing that topic. So if we've got those conditions and we, we have this decision to make, How should we choose which project to pay online? So there's the answer down there. Let's rule the last one out. Should we pick the project with the lowest DCFRR? No, that's clear. We don't pick the lowest DCFRR. But now let's take a look back at what we've learned a few weeks ago. Should we pick the project with the highest NPV? about the fact that these are all wrong. Let's, let's just consider the NPV case. Should we pick the project with the greatest NPV? What does it mean by picking the project with the largest NPV? The interpretation. A good thing about projects like Titan, you're not the most money, you're the only value for your investment in the project and that makes a profit. So pick the project with the greatest profit if the NPV is positive. So that's the second one. What about picking a project with the largest rate of return, ECFRR? I'm oh, sorry, the third one. The project with the highest rate of return, ECFRR. That sounds intuitive, right? We're getting the most value for our money. Yeah? Uh, it doesn't necessarily say that it's greater than they are in that case. So there are other Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, so we don't know necessarily that that DCFRR is exceeding the MMRR for sure. Okay, so now let's come to this one. We'll pick the project with the DCFRR greater than the rate of return. We know that if DCFRR exceeds MARR, it should have a positive impact. criteria that we saw earlier, they apply when we're looking at independent projects. When we're looking at mutually alternative projects, our evaluation method needs to be a little bit different. Because what we're going to see here is that you're going to buy one or the other, and it's that or that's causing the difference here. In the previous example, you can pick and, 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 so you accumulate all your rates of returns and your NPVs up. Here we're looking at alternatives, and that's what's uh, was going to cause the issue. One way we can look at this conception, um, actually let me just come back to this point over here, picking projects with the highest DCFRR, and emphasize why I've highlighted the word, or I've emphasized the word investment in the case. If I invest one dollar, so this is my cost, and then a year later my income is two dollars, What's my rate of return? It's 100%. Okay, so I've made a 100% rate of return. If I invest $1,000 and I return $1,200 the next year, what's my rate of return? 20%. Rate of return. Okay, 
Okay, so this is why we say pick the investment with the highest DCFRR, or sorry, I should say here the largest investment with the DCFRR exceeding MARR, because this one has the highest rate of return, but you're only getting one dollar extra. So this is the, the lowest investment. You invest one dollar and you get a hundred percent rate of return on it. That sounds great on paper when you look at the dollar figures though, it's different. And so we see here the issue with relative rates of return is that they are uh, rates of return is that they're a relative metric. Picking the largest investment with the greatest rate of return is going to, to give us a better job. So bear that thought in mind now when we look at the next, uh, the next slides. So when we're looking at this, we can conceive the, our approach as we, we've got a certain amount of money to invest. And as I invest that money, we would like, and we should expect that my, income, my profit, revenue minus expenses, so this axis over here is profit, it's vertical axis. It would be great if this line just went up and up and up. So the more you invest, the greater your profit. But that, that won't happen in practice. There's diminishing returns with it. One way we can conceive our MARR, our minimal acceptable rate of return, is that's simply a slope. So once the company decides their rate of return, say 12%, 15%, that fixes that angle of that line. That's, the, that's in fact what that minimum rate of return is. Rate of return is profits divided by investment. So that line, we can just take it and move it around, and as long as this curve is tangential above that rate of return, I can invest, invest, and I move that line over until I get to a point where it's no longer profitable to invest. Okay, so the slope of this line, this red line, is given by the rate of return. So if your rate of return is 12%, it's that angle. If your rate of return is 20, 30%, it's a steeper line. As we invest more you know, in our projects, we're going to see this next. We can always rank our projects from lowest investment to highest investment. If we're choosing amongst two or three or four alternatives, we can always order them. There's always going to be one project that's going to cost less to invest in, another project that's going to cost a little bit more to invest in. So those projects are going to return different amounts of profits. And the tendency we find is that that curve that takes on that shape. So we keep investing until that, oh, we keep investing until that curve matches that slope of the rate of return. So the project? We're picking one project. So we're gonna keep moving along and pick, start from our smallest project and go up in the project's costs the investment cost until we get to a point where it's no longer profitable to invest. Now, this is a little bit of a thought exercise, of course, because practical investments are discrete. And so we don't get that smooth curve. But you can see this if you make very small, if you consider your investment from an incremental amount. Okay, but it's a topic that we won't go into. The key point that I want to emphasize, however, is the new concept that you might not have been aware of is that the rate of return can be considered a slope on this sort of curve. And we're going to see this now in this uh, next example that comes to play. And when we start to put numbers to it, this will uh, make more sense. So consider the following two cases. You've got two projects, project A and project B. And they both have an investment in year zero, and they return a certain amount of money in year one. And it's reasonable for that is so it's simple to calculate our DCFRR. So I invest a thousand dollars, I get two thousand a year back, I've doubled my money, my rate of return is hundred percent. I can calculate the NPV for that project, it's eight hundred and eighty dollars. My alternative project, mutually exclusive project, is to invest five thousand dollars, return seven thousand, so I make a profit here, it seems of two thousand. If I take time value of money into account, that comes into one, three, six, four. From an NPV perspective, the rate of return of four percent. Which is the better project to pick? Do you pick A or B? <coughs> Argue with the person next to you.
so thoughts on this. Which one, which perspective, or sorry, which project would you pick? Uh, sorry, A. Anyone? A. <laughs> a. Yeah. You pick A because you have an extra $4,000 invested, maybe 10% to make up the difference in the NPDs. Okay, so David's saying you've got that extra 4000 that you could invest to make up the difference in the NPDs. So let's take a look at that. If I invest in Project A, So I'm going to invest in Project A and then I'm going to invest in the bank. So I've got $5,000 to spend. I'm going to sink $1,000 into Project A. Next year it's going to return $2,000. In the bank I'm going to put $4,000 and it's going to return interest at 10% because that's the minimal acceptable rate of return here. And it's, that's what's uh, that's $1,600? 4,000 times 10% is 400, so 400 a year later, yeah. Okay, so, so now my total cash flows are, so if I sum up this way, I'm going to get 5,000 sunk in, and my NPV is, sorry, uh, my, my money return is 2,400, the difference is, Oh, yeah, sorry, 4,400, thank you. Um, so 44, so 6,400, so I get 6,400 back, so I get 1,640. Ah, yeah, <laughs> okay, so 1,400. If we take time value of money into account though, because this cash flow of 6,400 is occurring the next year, if we take that into account, TBM, that's not 1,460, it's a number that's smaller. Okay. So that incremental amount that you get back from the bank, combined with your investment here, is less than 1,364. Okay. But you're thinking on the right track. If, we, if time value of money were to factor, that would be a, a better alternative. But time value of money is a factor, so this is just shy of that. Right. But great idea. So that's the principle here. When you're picking about between alternative investments, you have a certain amount of money to invest. You're always going to pick one of your investments. You pick the largest one, that's, that's kind of your budget. If you pick one of the smaller ones, you can consider taking the rest of the money and investing it in a bank account somewhere and getting a rate of return at the minimal acceptable rate of return, so MARR. So that's what's shown here in the last column. You invest $4,000 into a bank account, you get $4,400 back the next um, year. The DCFRR just on that column is 10%. If you take time value of money into account, that's, there's no benefit on this option because that option over there is formed at the time value of money rate, the minimal acceptable rate of return. So NPV for that option is zero. Is that really like valid assumption though that banks are going to give you a more acceptable rate of return? TD for instance doesn't care. No, okay, so this isn't necessarily a bank. Oh, From a company's bank. perspective, that's how they determine their minimal acceptable rate of return. It could be the stock market, it could be their shareholders, um, they could issue bonds and so forth. So a bank is someone else. Basically, it's a risk, relatively risk-free option that the company has, an alternative that they validly have. Okay. So in this case, then, Project B seems to be the better choice from the NPV's perspective. From the DCFRR's perspective, Project A seems to be the better measure. Now let's look at it from a, a different approach. Take the difference between cash flows between Project B and A. So Instead of investing all your money uh, there, to invest in Project A, the incremental amount is to invest an additional $4,000, and you will get that incremental cash flow of $5,000. Compute the DCFRR on that, on those two money flows, and you get a 25% rate of return, and your NPV on the incremental amount is $5,000. So 
this is our approach that we're going to take. Now I'm going to give you the, the procedure we use to then make our decision at the end of this. So let's go two slides ahead while we're on that topic. So use uh, so this is slide 178. If we're deciding amongst mutually exclusive alternatives, this is the procedure we follow. Calculate the DCFRR for the smallest investment. So what is the rate of return on the cheapest option? If that rate of return exceeds the minimal acceptable rate of return, so whatever the company's MARR is, we take that project tentatively. That's our current best choice. Would be the cheapest option, right? So the, the lowest amount of money spent, as long as that rate of return exceeds the MARR, we, we keep that option. If we don't keep that option, we still haven't made a decision yet. We haven't chosen any of our options. So we go to the next highest investment and repeat that process. If the next highest investment has a DCFRR that exceeds NARR, we accept that next highest investment. Okay, so after this approach here of iterating through this bullet point, you will accept one investment at the end of it, even if it is the largest investment that you possibly have. So by investment, we're talking about that amount of money sunk in. How much do you spend? So bullet point one, you will always, by the end of that bullet point, have picked an investment. And it may not be the first, the cheapest one, but you need to pick one at least that has that DCFRR that exceeds MARR. Calculate the DCFRR then next on what we call this incremental investment amount. So you invest, calculate these deltas as we did here on the previous slide. So calculate the incremental cash spent, the incremental cash income, and calculate the DCFRR on that incremental amount spent. And accept that only if that incremental DCFRR exceeds the MARR. So in other words, it says, in this example, I would accept project B if that 25% exceeds the MARR, which it does in this case. So because that 25% exceeds 12, uh, 10 in this example, I will accept project B for that incremental investment to go from A to B. We had multiple parts of the D minus C and C minus B. Yeah, so let's say we've picked B over here. The, the B was, you ranked your project from low to high. So project B. A didn't make this criteria, but B did. So now we move to this step. Then you check C versus B. Okay, so for the next largest investment. So you only do one, one incremental check. And then if C minus D didn't, uh, C minus D meets this criteria, then you accept project C. If it doesn't meet that criteria, then you move up to the next one. What is incremental investment? That's the additional amount you have to spend beyond your base consideration. So here in this case, we're comparing project A to B. I have to spend an additional $4,000. That's my incremental investment. So you can see this in the case where, um, let's say project B was take whatever project A is, but project B is an upgrade onto project A. So like I said, it's the heat exchanger, is project A, but then the heat exchanger with additional uh, control loops, that's project B. So it's that incremental amount for that extra spending to get that upgrade feature. Okay. Well, essentially what we're doing is we're going to check, is that upgraded feature worth it? Okay. So is it worth it? It needs to be worth it if the rate of return of that extra feature is more exceeds our MARR. So that's where we're going with this sort of thing. You're you always you want to pick you want to spend as little as possible with the highest return. Okay, but if you have to spend more, you want to make sure that your return on spending more is still worth it. But right? there's going to be a point where you can spend more, but not get the money back in terms of your MARR. Sorry, so you 
So you're thinking back to independent projects. So if you're with independent projects, you always have the option of doing that. Here we don't have that option. We have to purchase an a project, A, B, or C, or D, or whatever our number is. Oh, sorry. I'm assuming it's project A and doing nothing with the. Oh right. Yes, I see what you're saying. Yes, yeah. So you're you're making a decision between either investing that money or going with the upgrade. If the upgrade is going to get you greater return, go with the upgrade or go with project B. If project B's return is going to be less than investing it, then yeah, then you wouldn't go to project B. Sure. That's a great way to see. Um, out of curiosity, would there ever be a case where the when you're considering like the incremental investment versus just project B that like the incremental investment would be like below the MARR but the product B would be above? Like would there ever have a case like that? Or would it be like a project B is below the MARR and the project B minus A B or they not like I have to check that. I don't think, yeah, there's something that makes you think not. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, we can look at something else. Yeah. Um, do they have to have the same lifetime capability? Yes, the project must have the same lifetime to, to, to assess this. Okay. So, I like that interpretation there where you can see it as, think of it back to the regular car example. You go to buy a car and you're looking at the upgrades. You're asking yourself that essentially in this approach, is that upgrade going to pay for itself? Okay. Or if you take a more practical example, I guess, from a chemical engineering perspective, is that upgrade a feature you're purchasing on the heat exchanger going to generate more profit for your company? So you're going to spend more money. Hopefully, you should see more profit. If you're not going to see more profit, then why are you spending more money? Your alternative is always to take that incremental amount you might have spent and invest it in your bank account and get a minimal acceptable rate of return. Okay, so that's why we're checking here in these columns. We calculate the incremental amounts and the incremental cash flows. If that ECFRR exceeds that MARR, we go with the, in with the next project. Okay, so this text here might not be the most clear description of the approach. It certainly is accurate, but it's, uh, it might be, I think that some of you in the class have a bit more of an intuitive understanding now based on that prior discussion. So let's take a look then at this example. This will um, perhaps help to, help to uh, solidify the concept. So we're working horizontally this time. So projects A, B, and C are running horizontally. The company has to purchase a filter press to clean up the waste stream separate solids from liquid. Either they do nothing, right? So you pump all your stuff into the sewer, which is going to cost you a whole lot of money. And so that feature, that 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 option is out of consideration, really, from a, if we have to be honest, Asian should be here. We have to pick one of these two. So either you pick the plate and frame filter press, or you go with the filter press that has the automatic cleaning option. So the automatic cleaning option means it opens itself up, dumps the solids out, and then goes and does the next cycle. If you, did, if you go with option B, you have to spend manpower to clean this filter out. Okay? So in option B, we're, we're using people to do our work for us. That's an ongoing cost. Or maybe in option C, I can spend a bit more money, a bit more capital up front, <laughs> and then I don't have to pay for those people to clean the filter out for me every day. So here's the cost. So we sink in $50,000 for the first filter press option, the base filter press. It's going to save me eleven thousand dollars a year. Okay. The NPV on that is four thousand six hundred, and the DCFRR is fourteen point six percent, which exceeds my company's twelve percent rate of return. So so far, this option looks pretty good. If we go back to our algorithm, it says order your projects from lowest investment to highest investment, and this is our lowest investment. It says accept this option if. DCFRRR, DCFRR exceeds MARR, which it does. Okay, so, we're, so tentatively, we've got an option that works for us. <coughs> then the algorithm says, go to the next project and look at it. So let's take a look. Option C is to spend $68,000, but we're going to save 14. So 
So I'm saving a little bit more money every year. And over the eight year life of this project, so it's eight years that this, it's going to, we're going to get savings of $14,000 in year one, two, three, up to eight. That works up to an NPV of 1,500. So a smaller NPV. But that's not how we should evaluate these options, right? Because we're not making an independent choice. We're not choosing A, a B, project B, and C. Right, so we don't look at these values. What we have to do is we have to look at, was this $18,000 that you spent here worth it? So is this extra $18,000 that going to sink in going to pay for itself? Well, let's take a look at how it's going to pay for itself. I'm going to spend extra $18,000, but I'm going to save an incremental $3,000 per year. So in year one, two, three, up to eight, I'm going to get a savings, an incremental savings of $3,000. Is that worth it? Yes or no? Why no? Okay, the DCFRR for that incremental amount is, is less than the MRR. So $3,000 over eight years, that's $24,000 you're going to save, but you had to spend an additional 18 up front to save that $24,000. Still works out, actually, take time value of money into account that that's actually you making a loss in that. Okay. So that just even from the NPE's perspective that's not profitable. From the MARR's perspective that's also not profitable. Spending eighteen thousand now to make three thousand uh, gets you that so not not worth it. So pick project B. That's that's as simple as it is. Just check the incremental amount. Now let's take a look at the next, the next option. What if instead of saving fourteen thousand a year, that that saved us fifteen five hundred? Savings here is 40, the, the final result here is right, but I, I, I it's a copy and paste error from the previous slide. That should be 4,500. So please correct that. Um, but this is accurate. That incremental amount now, that saving 50,500, now is actually worth it for you. It brings your rate of return up there to 86%. So take then option C, the option with the auto. Okay, so everything in that table is accurate except for those 3,000 figures. That should be uh, the difference there. Yeah. And also that PV should be positive, right? Or yeah, I think it should be plus 4,354. Four. Okay, so it's a little bit of a confusing from an initial perspective looking at this, but if you visualize it or understand it in terms of the principle of upgrading and checking whether the upgrade is worth it, uh, this topic can make a little bit more sense. The other thing that, why this example is over here is that shows you that this project is fairly sensitive to this economic value over here. That income or saving that you make from the auto clean, a very marginal savings of 1,500 difference from the previous case where we had 14,000 and now we go to 15,000. 500 has changed your decision and has changed your your profitability. Yes, sir. Uh, for option B, you said that labor is required to take that into consideration in your savings. So in option B, there's labor, labor required. Yeah, so this would be, you could say, net savings. So there's, there's a savings of money due to the fact that you're not polluting anymore, but it's going to cost you people power. So this would be the net profit. With the auto clean option, that's basically telling you that's the cost of not having people to use for you. Okay, so this 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 example raises the, the topic of sensitivity with um, the 
against our economic analysis. We had said earlier that we were making assumptions that our cash flows are relatively certain with low error. But you've seen in our work over the past two, three weeks that that assumption is not a fair assumption to make, especially when it comes to uh, capital costs. Even amongst all of your answers for assignment four this week, there's a large variation on what it costs to hire an operator and what a manager costs. No surprise, because depending on your source of information, it's going to be a different number. In different parts of the country, it's going to be a different number as well. So large uncertainty in those quantities. And when you're designing a, a plant and planning for a new facility or an expansion of an existing facility, you're going to face this uncertainty. How are you going to judge the robustness of your financial analysis? that uncertainty. What might be some of the ways you could judge? That? Here's another example that you can consider at the same time. We looked at savings for your child's RESP projected out for the next 23 years. What uncertainties exist in that analysis and how are you going to judge the robustness of Okay, so that inflation of uh, 4% and interest of 6% in that RESP example would be constant. That would certainly uh, be not true. We know that for sure. What other uncertainties exist in that example of the RESP and also any of the examples, for example, the Argentina case study we looked at in assignment 3? What uncertainties exist? Consider that we've we built our plants, or we're going to build our plant next year as a year or two, so we don't expect great technological advances to impact us. But I can see it if like, you're planning for five years from now that that certainly would be a massive case. Is that your cash flow? Specifically, which. So your cash flows have uncertainty. Uh, in the RESP example, they're saying that you could, you could, you could get a bonus and start in, in saving a bit more. I'm talking about more uncertainty. Like that is the decision you make. I'm, what we're trying to understand is uncertainties that are beyond our control, which we have little in control of. And we still want to make sure we're going to make a profit at the end. In the RG, exchange rates. So the exchange rates in the Argentina example. Uh, market value or market perception. Okay, so market value. And how would that impact your cash flows? Uh, it'll affect your revenue. So income or sales price. That you're selling your final product for. Political issues and how, and how again would that affect? But like which aspects in our cash flows might that impact? Uh, it might actually affect your workers. Like, it might not be able to work to do like, uprising. Okay, so if your workers aren't able to come to work due to strikes or political events, which specific number in our cash flows are going to suffer? Okay, so likely revenue because you now have no product to sell. Taxes. Taxes, so tax rates. Okay. So if the political government changes and they start to tax business more heavily or less heavily, the tax rate will certainly go. 
if the cost of wages increases, do you think your costs will go up? Okay, so cost of wages. So if you'll come to, we're we we're looking at things beyond our control. So if uh, if our employees need or demand more money and they go on strike and then we don't make sales, and then we say, okay, well, we're going to pay you a bit more so please come back to work. Our cost of wages have gone up, but will all our other costs also go up because of that? Or is that what you're asking? Well, I'm just thinking that just the cost for the thing. Like if, if the government says minimum wage, like a specific thing, if it increases, then you also going to pay more to either install it or... Okay, so minimum wage may, might go up. Okay, so utilities. Okay, so if the war breaks out or natural disaster, again, likely it's going to just impact, well, not just impact, but it's going to impact your revenues. Yeah. Which of these are more, more likely to happen than others? More acts of market value. So this is going to change for sure. That's going to almost certainly change over the over a lifetime of the process. In Canada, we're probably pretty lucky that our tax rates are going to be fairly stable. And our political environment is likely to be stable as well. Not so in other places of the world. Uh, how about utility costs? Think about the last five, ten years, what has happened to some of the major utility costs in the United States? Going up, come down, natural gas, down, up. Okay, so tremendous fluctuations in utilities in the past five, ten years in, in, in different directions for some of the various utilities. Okay, so no, no specific direction over there. The, so this is where we're heading, right, with the uncertainty and the sensitivity analysis. Next question, how are you going to judge the impact of these on your cash flow? Okay, so the suggestion here is assume that whatever uncertainties you have will impact all your projects on an equal basis. Is that it? Okay, okay, that's what you're saying. Okay, so that's that's one option, yeah? You assign like a risk number to the project and evaluate that against the return for those projects. Okay, how would you come up with that risk number that you wish to assign to each project? that some of these these uncertainties are more likely than others and we can then Sorry, yeah go ahead yeah no no <coughs> okay so the great good question here how does this differ from the MARR which should capture some amount of risk built into that MARR value any suggestions how this So we'll hold that thought for a minute. Yeah. Now, if we have these uncertainties, what can we do about them? And so we know that interest rates are going to go up. We know exchange rates are going to vary. And the sales price of our company and the sales price of our raw material, of our final product is going to go up or down. What can we do? Try to predict them and adjust our prices accordingly. Okay, so absolutely predict them and then 
what can we do with, like, in the context of what we've covered over the past four, four or five weeks? What is what has really been our goal over the past five five weeks? Not just to learn a whole lot of economic stuff, but at the end, what we really want to do is judge that any decision we make as engineers is going to be worth it over the long term. So if we have these uncertainties, how can I judge that despite the uncertainties, things are still going to be worth it or not? You could increase each by a percentage and see how it affects the actual individual and then assign risk number because now you know how much each uh, one will affect the actual. Okay. So the suggestion here is to vary each one of these individually and, and look at it how it affects your cash flow. What about your cash flow are you going to check? By your ability goes up with that. And by how much? By how much? Which? I just said a different point. Um, okay. A lot of companies use the CEQA approach when they're investing in new products or process innovations. So basically they'll look at marginal risk and invest in slightly more money in hidden projects to see if it's worth it to spend your technology. Okay. Okay. So Kevin's throwing out a great word uh, that you can go look at in your own time, stage gates. It's a, it's a good concept and you'll see this for sure in your career when companies are making decisions. But uh, just <coughs> two, three minutes left, so I just want to talk, come back and just wrap up this topic and the, the, the point about MARR. So we've got these variabilities in our cash flow analysis. The simplest thing that we do is to go back to those Excel spreadsheets that you generate and vary these numbers up and down. Change your exchange rates up and down, the market values up or down, and check what? NPV. Anything else? DCFRR. And look at plots of those as a function of how much these change. Okay, so over the weekend, think about this. If I plot sales price, and this is NPV, what is that curve going to look like? So if here's my base sales price, let's say $25 a kilogram, what is that curve going to look like when, it's, when sales price changes? What if I change my x-axis to be salaries? Okay. What if I change my x-axis to be the current exchange rate between Argentina and pesos and Canadian dollars? So think of that concept. We'll look at that next week to wrap up the topic. And then coming back to, to finish up with the MNRR, MNRR is always going to be our baseline. We still want to be profitable, even despite that.